This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When rescue workers are sent to the scene of an emergency, they never know what they'll encounter or who the victim might be. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of courageous people who stepped forward in a moment of crisis on Rescue 911. We begin at a local high school in the small town of Tip City, Ohio, on the morning of May 9, 1988. 17-year-old Tess Donauer was a senior at the school. I was walking to class and um, it was about five to eight, so everyone was, you know, talking to their friends and just getting ready for class. And I was looking for Mr. Suter, which is why I saw it happen. I was walking into the cafeteria to give Mr. Suter my um, pass to get out of study hall for the day. Over here. Mr. Suter was just gathering papers, getting his attendance sheet out. <laughs> To see someone collapse and not breathe and just die in front of you it was really, really scary. And immediately, instinct, I ran to the office. I said, Mr. Suter fell down and called the ambulance. She told me to go down and get Mr. Judy, who knew CPR. Someone in the office called the police, while teacher Irv Collins ran to help. I suspected that it was more than just fainting. I remember thinking that I'd better get to that cafeteria as quickly as I can. Ralph had already started turning blue. Uh, his eyes were clouded over, and he was frothing at the mouth. If I had a Kleenex, I remember cleaning that out of his mouth and then checking his jugular vein to see if there was any pulse. At that time, I uh, could feel nothing. Everybody, please move back. Get out of the cafeteria. Please. I knew that it was a very serious situation and I didn't want the kids to be around Mr. Suter. Tip City Emergency Service, Squad 1, this is your call. Respond At 7.59 a.m., a call for help went out to the town's volunteer emergency rescue unit. 7.59. Tess found health teacher Jim Judy, a certified CPR instructor, in his classroom. I had in the back of my mind that it might be a coronary just because of the uh, risk factors. He didn't exercise, he was a, a smoker, plus his age, that uh, I knew that you know, it just might be a heart attack. Jim, there's no pulse, no breathing. I went to go in, but the teachers were pushing all the students out, so I just kind of stood back and watched. One, two, three. I, I thought it was hopeless. It just seemed like forever for the rescue squad to get there. When we continue. I was just amazed that this teacher who I had had was lying there dead on the floor. It had been five minutes since high school teacher Ralph Souter had suffered a heart attack during study hall. Volunteer rescue workers met at the station to pick up their vehicles and headed to the scene. 26-year-old paramedic Gary Jackson was in charge. I had a lot of alarm bells going off on this run for some reason in my mind that it was going to be a bad one. Keep in mind when a person's heart stops or they stop breathing, you have 
four to six minutes to get oxygen back into that system before brain damage sets in. One, two, Ralph three, was not blinking four, his eyes. Five, he had no pulse. For all practical purposes, one, Ralph was gone. Three, three, but we just four, felt like we five, could not give up because Ralph was a very close one, friend. One, two, three, four, five. Start to vomit again. Come on, Ralph. Hang on there. I went into just uh, a different mode in which uh, I didn't feel anything. There weren't any emotions that I felt at that particular time. It was just a matter of, of doing the procedure, and it was almost like watching somebody else uh, do it. Both paramedic Jackson and EMT Todd Stalker had graduated from the same school less than eight years earlier. The things that were running through my mind at that point were... I don't know who this person is yet, and I'm really afraid to find out. Three, four, five. I walked to the cafeteria. I was shocked when I saw who they were doing CPR on. And I immediately met, recognized Mr. Souter having been a former student of his in sophomore chemistry class. One, two, three, four. A friendly five, teacher, a good teacher. Anybody had a specific two, problem, three. he'd more than willing to stay after class or even stay after school to help you out with it. Hat set up. Let's see what he's got on the monitor. Okay. We've got BPEB. Okay. Very shocking. Charge paddle. I was scared because I hadn't really been on that many cardiac arrests. I was just amazed that this teacher who I had had was lying there dead on the floor. One, two, three. Okay, let's hit him again. 200 again. In VFib, the heart is basically quivering. There's no pump action. The electrical activity is very disorganized. Okay. Uh, our protocol down, for people in VFib is immediate counter shocks. Go VFib. Okay, one more time. Let's hit him at 300 this time. Everyone clear. Clear. I was frustrated and very discouraged when the first three initial Go shocks VFib. didn't work. They teach you in class if you're going to convert somebody, you're going to convert them on the first or second shock. I was handed the our initial cardiac drugs. I administered those drugs per protocols uh, with no change in the electrical activity of the heart. Uh, at this point, I decided that we needed to shock him one more time at maximum wattage and go ahead and load and go to the hospital regardless of what we got. Okay, okay, we got a rhythm. We got a pulse to go with that? Yes, we got a pulse. Okay, let's okay. get it. Everybody was elated. It was as though we had received a shot of adrenaline. Uh, the tension in the room was let out. You could breathe again. It's one of the first true conversions of an arrest patient that I'd ever witnessed in the field. One, two, three. The immediate administration of bystander CPR by Mr. Judy and Mr. Collins in this situation gave the squad something valuable to work with when they got on the scene. It's very rare that I've ever seen civilians give effective CPR. My concern, what degree of brain damage were we going to have here? I got the doors. He was in a coma. It's during that time that I was the most concerned whether we had been effective giving CPR. Because in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, well, maybe we just didn't do an effective enough job, didn't get enough uh, oxygen to the brain, and that he might have uh, suffered brain damage. Not responding to painful stimuli. After 20 minutes without a heartbeat, Ralph Souter entered Stouter Memorial Hospital in critical condition with little hope for a full recovery. Doctors tried to prepare his wife, Diane, for the worst. When the neurologist told me that Ralph might be in a coma for a long time, I was numb. And um, he said the longer he was in a coma, the more neurological damage there probably was going to be. Can you hear me, Ralph? From the very first moment that I went in and, and took his hand and told him that I was there, it was just very evident that he was fighting and that he wanted to get out of this. Um, it was evident for the next six weeks, no matter how bleak the situation would get, uh, just when a doctor would come in and give us the worst possible prognosis, the very next day or the very next evening would be when we would start seeing Ralph fight so much harder. Perhaps in part because of Diane's faithful support, 
Ralph came out of the coma, suffering only temporary memory loss. After undergoing heart bypass surgery, Ralph was back teaching that same fall. Today, Ralph is one of the happiest guys I've ever known. He's changed his whole lifestyle. He quit smoking cigarettes, he's watching his diet, and he seems so much more relaxed. How many of you would be working on the autobiography? And how many of you on Lotus? Ralph cannot forget his fellow teachers and former students who were there when he needed them most. It's very difficult to put into words how you feel about people who saved your life. I feel very close to them. I feel very close also to the people who supported me in the school after the incident. I'm totally lost when it comes to computers. You taught me a lot about science, which is something I really didn't care about. Mr. Time. Seward took chemistry, made it interesting, made it exciting, showed the practicality of chemistry in everyday life. I feel great to see Mr. Suter out back teaching. It gives me a good feeling that I played a, at least a small part in making that possible, to bring him back, to give him that chance to you know, lead a full life. I was so happy that I could, I mean, come back from having him as a teacher, giving him all the trouble that I did, and then ended up saving his life. So it, it was amazing. I think knowing CPR is one of the most important things that anyone can do for themselves and anyone else around them. It's, it's not just something that people say. It really does save lives. Even the children realize that we've been given a gift of extra time here. Watch the car. Ready? Ready? I can't imagine being without Ralph. I can't imagine our family without him, the, the children or myself. It's made me realize the abilities that I have. And it's given me time that I think I will make very good use of, or at least I will try to. And I'm very appreciative of that time. Feels great, Carrie. Keep it up. Okay. Next, 